On WealthTrack, Harvard Capital Advisors Christoph Gleisch chooses best-in-class money managers to partner with for years. So one of the things that we look for in, in managers, really from a behavioral perspective, is how open-minded they are, how self-reflective they are, how introspective they are, and do, you know, do they learn from their past mistakes to improve and adapt their process on a go-forward basis. How does he pick them? Find out on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. 2022 has been a rough year for investors as both stock and bond markets declined in the first quarter. Regardless of market performance, investors continue to favor passive index funds over actively managed ones. More than $100 billion left actively managed mutual funds in the first three months of the year, the worst outflows since the first quarter of 2020. In contrast, lower cost index funds took in over $200 billion in new money. Investors continue to favor ETFs, exchange traded funds over mutual funds. The vast majority of funds and ETFs are in passive strategies. But there's an interesting divergence occurring. One of the fastest growing segments in the ETF universe is actively managed ETFs. They reached a record $453 billion globally, up 3.4% in the first quarter, with net inflows of nearly $33 billion, the second highest on record. Well, this week's guest is involved in both actively managed mutual funds and ETFs, and one of his main responsibilities is identifying best-in-class managers for both. He is Christoph Gleisch, President and Chief Investment Officer of Harbor Capital Advisors. Prior to joining the firm in 2018, he was Global Head of Manager Selection at J.P. Morgan Chase. Harbor Capital is well known with the investment management industry, but for those of you not familiar with it, here's a brief description. Begun as the pension advisory arm of Old Line Packaging Manufacturer Owens, Illinois, Harbor Capital became independent over 30 years ago. It is known for choosing top quality independent money managers to run specific mutual funds under the Harbor Capital name. It currently oversees $55 billion of targeted strategies, which includes 16 equity mutual funds and five fixed income funds. It also recently launched a suite of actively managed ETFs, some with unusual objectives. I began the interview by asking Gleich to take us through the process of choosing money managers to partner with. What does he look for? I think the first thing is to have an open mind um, with where you may find managers with a specific expertise. And we have a phrase that we talk about here at Harbor, which we refer to as Alpha Edge. Um, you know, investing in markets is extremely competitive. There's a lot of market participants, and generally, markets are pretty efficient. And so, the first thing that we ask ourselves when we come across a manager is what is their alpha edge? What is it that they are doing um, that should provide a sustainable or competitive advantage on a go forward basis that they're going to be able to produce a superior outcome to purely passive investing? That may be better excess returns in the market or just better risk adjusted returns or whatever they're solving for. I'll give you an example. If we're investing in a, in a growth manager, um, what we'd be looking for is a manager that is able on a, um, a proactive basis to identify a portfolio of different businesses across different sectors that have a superior growth rate going out. They may have um, specific expertise in certain industries, maybe technology or industrials. And so it's really sort of asking ourselves from a first principles perspective, what is this manager good at? What is their edge? And why do we think they're going to be able to continue to deliver that on a go forward basis? How do you determine that they have an alpha edge to begin with? We'll look at a variety of different factors, performance uh, definitely being one of them. Um, I think a trap that investors too often fall into is chasing performance right. and essentially just buying what's done well, selling what hasn't done well recently, and then typically mean reversion kicks in 
and that leads to, uh, on average, poorer investment outcomes. Um, and what we do is we take performance and we try and disaggregate that performance between ultimately what is luck and what is skill. And what we try and isolate is what we call the idiosyncratic piece of a manager's return. The idiosyncratic piece is the bit that's left over, the true alpha, if you like, that's left over after accounting for various different style biases or sector biases that they have. We don't need to employ an active manager to give us exposure to broad-based benchmarks. We want to find managers that are sort of concentrated, they are disciplined and they do one or two things, you know, extraordinarily well. Um, and then when we look at performance, that should give a return stream that is hard or indeed impossible to replicate through low cost uh, index investing. And by its very nature will then be less correlated and therefore more valuable uh, for clients' portfolios. What about uh, culture? I mean, what are, the, what are some of the other things that you, that you look at? I think, I think you've, um, you've hit the nail on the head with the C word, culture. Mm -hmm. And the phrase that we like to use here at Harbour is identifying managers that have a culture of continuous improvement. The only guarantee uh, we can really make about the future is unexpected things are going to happen. The world is going to evolve. Uh, the markets are a dynamic system constantly changing. Um, one of my pet peeves in the industry is when managers show you a presentation or a pitch book and say it hasn't changed one iota in the last 20 years. And I sort of think to myself, in what other industry is it acceptable to not improve and change and invest in yourself over time? So one of the things that we look for in, in managers, really from a behavioral perspective, is how open-minded they are, how self-reflective they are, how introspective they are, and do, you know, do they learn from their past mistakes to improve and adapt their process on a go-forward basis? Or as the world is changing around them, do they bring on new technologies? Do they bring on new capabilities to help them understand the world um, and invest with more clarity and more skill on a go-forward basis? And we think that's really important to you know, go on site with managers, get to know them uh, over a, a long time, um, and continually stay on top of what they're doing and assess that culture to make sure um, what you own is what you're originally uh, originally invested in. So that was my next question to you, is what role does Harbor Capital Advisors play? After we've gone through a extensive vetting process uh, to select a money manager, um, we essentially hire that manager to run an offering for us, be it a, a collective investment trust, a mutual fund, or an, an ETF. Um, we really well then want to sort of stay on top of that manager, stay close to what's going on. So we have full transparency into all of our managers' portfolios. Um, we are data junkies here. We like to look at performance versus our own expectations of the manager. Again, I think this is one point that our, our industry or investors don't do enough of is writing down your expectations before you make an investment is a great way so you have a game plan before you invest, which can help you re remain sort of objective through the various ups and downs um, of investing, of which there's always plenty. And then we're in constant dialogue with our managers, talking through the portfolios, why they've made certain decisions, ultimately challenging them uh, and keeping them honest uh, to make sure that they are still delivering on that promise uh, that they set out on when we first made that investment. You're making a cost aware uh, investment decisions as well. So what does cost aware mean? Fees are very important. Right. Uh, the, 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 the most guaranteed source of alpha is doing the same thing that you're doing today, but doing it tomorrow more cheaply. Uh, fees and value are near and dear to our heart here at Harbour. We began life as the pensions and investments department for an industrial conglomerate at, in Toledo, Ohio. And we ran the pension money for our blue collar colleague workers. And so making sure that we were delivering value for our colleagues gave us a real sense of purpose that has carried through um, to today. 
Uh, all of our mutual funds are no load. Um, indeed, that's always been the case since we launched our first mutual fund back in 1986. Mm -hmm. And then we're striving to you know, negotiate and drive a hard bargain on behalf of our clients with our managers. We're institutional in size. That allows us to get institutional pricing with managers. And we typically uh, come in certainly you know, at or below median in terms of the different asset classes where we have different managers. Um, but we, all, we ultimately think about uh, value in terms of the quality and the net of after fee return that we're delivering for clients. And so you've got an additional hurdle to overcome though. You've got the, the, the fees that the funds you're, that you are, that are sub-advising for you that they charge, even though they're institutional rates. Plus you've got your fee on top of that, right? You've got to be paid as well. Does that make kind of your hurdle rate have to be even higher as far as the, you know, the, the alpha edge that you expect from your sub-advisors? No, not, not at all. Okay. What we are focused on uh, when looking at fees for clients is that all-in fee that cl clients pay, including any fee that the manager receives or that we receive, and we make sure that those fees are competitive versus all of the other solutions that exist in the asset classes where we have solutions. Give me an example of kind of your best work and the best partners that you've got. And so would the Harbor Capital Appreciation Fund fit that bill? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit like asking me to, I have three sons picking right. my favorite child. Um, that said, I think the relationship that we have with Jenison yes. is special. Mm -hmm. And Jenison for a, are the manager that run the capital appreciation mutual fund for us. They run a collective investment trust and they also run uh, an active ETF. And uh, so why do I say that? We have been partners and invested with Jenison for over 51 years as a firm, uh, which I think in a world that is seemingly increasingly focused on the short term is, is really extraordinary. Um, and there's you know, so many lessons to, to pull from that. I think the first lesson is the long, uh, investing in the long run wins. Uh, you know, we believe that compounding really is the eighth wonder of the world. And far more important than timing the markets is time in the markets. And so if you think about everything that's happened since we hired Jenison 51 years ago, think of all of the exogenous shocks that we've been through. Um, you know, the crash of 1987, uh, different wars, the tech bubble, the financial crisis, the COVID pandemic, None of these uh, you could have seen before they happened. Yet what was important was to have the trust and the conviction in a manager like Jenison that, that means that we then are able to retain conviction as the markets are going through all of these gyrations. And really what's that resulted in is Jenison's been running our mutual fund since 1991 and a $10,000 investment back in 1991 is now worth over $400,000 in today's money, despite all those gyrations that we've seen. And they, a number of the things that I spoke to earlier in terms of improving, investing in their people, but also staying true to their true north of secular growth investing mm -hmm. through the cycle in a disciplined way has ultimately proven to the benefit of our long-term client. Jenison and you know Harbor Capital Appreciation Fund has had a terrific run, terrific track record, but this year has just been you know terrible for growth fund managers such as Jenison and certainly the Harbor Capital Appreciation Fund, which is down more than twenty percent uh, so far this year. So you know, how do you you know judge your partners, your sub advisors during market? difficulties like we're going through now uh, when their style of investing is out of favor and basically getting hammered. Let me start with what's causing some of those market gyrations. Um, you know, I think the biggest concern right now for investors is inflation. And, you know, for the first time in decades, we have a real inflation problem in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we've seen that with recent inflation prints. Uh, we've seen it with the state of housing. We have a very, very hot housing uh, market and, and the employment markets are very, very strong. So we're at this unique moment at the moment where you know inflation is running hot and that's causing a lot of volatility in the markets. We, we expect that volatility to largely continue uh, for the foreseeable future. As it pertains to your question around how do you oversee managers, you both want to be very close to what they're doing, but you also want to give them a little bit of space as well. And over the last 50 years, if you've been able to identify companies that can grow through the market cycle at healthy double digit rates, much higher than the market rate, ultimately that's proven to be a long term winning strategy. And we very much feel that's still the case with uh, with Jenison. As far as your, your conversations with Jenison, again, this is just as an example. You know, what are they telling you and what are you telling them as far as this period right now? Clearly, you know, interest rates have, or financial conditions, I should say, um, have tightened pretty significantly yes, they already. Have. Uh-huh. If, you, if you look at where we are in the, you know, the two-year, uh, the five-year or the 10-year Treasury, you've seen a, a pretty significant tightening up in financial conditions, which is obviously in anticipation of um, what the market expects. Uh, from the Federal Reserve. Right, and it expects um, it to be much more aggressive in its tightening than it has in the past. Right. A- ab- absolutely. Um, so as it pertains to, um, you know, with, with, with Jenison or really with any approach in investing, again, it's not overreacting to the short term. It's making sure that you stay disciplined to that alpha edge that has proven successful for you over the long run. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the, the hallmarks of great investors are they use short-term volatility and time horizon as a form of arbitrage. A manager like Jenison will say there are many high conviction names that they have that are on sale. Um, and so they'll be rotate their portfolio into some of those higher conviction names to really set themselves up for that next cycle of outperformance. What is the advantage of going with, through you, through Harbor Capital Advisors, a, a one of your funds, versus just going kind of directly to the fund managers themselves? Well, I think we, we have a, a reputation now for being good at manager selection. Uh-huh. And often in, in um, more cases than not, um, we have exclusivity with our managers. And so for clients in the US to access our managers, whether it's through CITs or mutual funds or active ETFs, the only way that you can actually get access to those managers is through Harbor. And you just said the kind of the magic phrase, active ETFs. (laughs) This is a new area for uh, Harbor, and you've just kind of launched a suite of active ETF funds. And what led you, why are you doing that? Um, I really think we're going to see a lot of uh, innovation and of active management in active ETFs. Historically, uh, ETFs have been associated with more passive or index index investing. Mm -hmm. Um, However, there was a change, a a regulatory change by the SEC in late 2019, which is informally referred to as the SEC rule, which has now really leveled the playing fields and made it... um, easier for active managers to launch active ETFs. So why are we excited about active ETFs? For a number of reasons. Um, Active ETFs bring with them certain distinctive advantages. Um, For example, they tend to be a little bit cheaper. And as we've already talked about, the importance of fees and and bringing down fees for clients is is really important. And so active ETFs are definitely going to have a role to play there. Active ETFs tend to be more transparent. Not always, but at Harbor, we are big believers in transparency. Mm -hmm. Transparency is a good thing. The more that the end investor can see and understand and relate to what they're invested in, we think the more likely that they're gonna stick with that investment, which we've already talked about, um, time in the market being that critical component for for wealth generation. And then lastly, in in the US, there are tax um, advantages for ETFs versus mutual funds. And so when investors bring that all together and they think about pricing, 
they think about transparency and they think about after-tax returns, um, ETFs have some embedded advantages in them. You're doing some interesting things with ETFs, and uh, one of them that I was intrigued with is called the Corporate Culture Leaders ETF, uh, and the symbol is uh, HAPY, H-A-P-Y. So in partnership with a behavioral scientist, uh, Dan Ariely, uh, talk to us about um, the Corporate Culture Leaders ETF. We're, so we're really excited about HAPPY, the ETF, and our partnership with Dan Ariely and Irrational Capital. Uh, every business leader worldwide in any industry says our most important asset is what? Our people. Our people. Mm-hmm. Leaders say it because it's true. Um, but when you think about creating good corporate cultures, and we spoke about investment cultures as being absolutely key to success, um, cultures are not accounted for from an accounting perspective. Money that you spend on bringing in talent, retaining, training, and developing that talent, every year they go through the, uh, the, the cost income uh, line of an income statement. And so that would suggest if something isn't accounted for correctly, there may be an inefficiency around it. Now, let me bring in where Dan comes in. Dan is a world famous behavioral economist Mm -hmm. and behavioral scientist. He runs Duke University's behavioral economics department. And Dan has become an expert in understanding human beings, decisions, how we make certain decisions, how actually we're pretty irrational in the way and we're, we're a bit more emotional when it comes to making decisions than as objective as we think we are. And he's also come to understand what motivates people in the workplace. And we think you know, motivation and engagement is a critical component in as part of uh, creating corporate culture. And so with Dan's unique expertise, his lifetime of learnings, and with some interesting alternative data sets that simply weren't available three, four, five years ago, we've managed to partner with Dan and create an index where we believe that index focuses in on uh, businesses with the best corporate culture, with the idea being that if you get culture right, everything else flows from that. And this ultimately will be reflected in longer term shareholder returns. So that's recently launched, right? That's correct. That launched uh, just a few months ago. The investment in it is still quite small, correct? That's correct. And I think if you think about what I talked about earlier in terms of the world changing around us, you know, we're continually understanding more and more about us as as people. um, And one of the things that I think you need to do to continue to generate strong investment returns for clients at any organization or any business is you have to continue to innovate. And um, via our our thorough process, we ultimately deduced that we think uh, with Irrational Capital, we've found a new factor. It's called the human capital factor. Uh And what we think we've done is we've made the human capital factor investable and, you know, investing in businesses that really care about their employees and really care about creating positive cultures that really get the best out of everybody can only be a good thing. Christoph, at the end of every Wealth Track interview, we ask our guests if there's one investment that we should all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio. I think within equities at the moment, um, having exposure to whether it's a, an active manager or an ETF that focuses on investing in high quality businesses, um, businesses that have brand and pricing power and that are able to pass on the effects of inflation at the moment, businesses that have you know, stronger balance sheets. Um, and typically a, a sort of a style like this that I'd recommend would be something around dividend investing or dividend growth investing. You get that higher quality, you get that capital appreciation, and you get that long-term compounding, and you ultimately get that income as well. Christoph, thank you so much for joining us on WealthTrack for the first time and explaining Harbor Capital Advisors to us as well. Consela, thank you very much for having me.
At the close of every Wealth Talk, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point comes to us courtesy of financial thought leader Charlie Ellis. It is minimize trading to minimize costs and taxes. Ellis takes the long view and advises never make an investment you don't expect to stay with for at least 10 years and hope to stay with for 25 years. He says if you invest this way, you will not only save on taxes and trading costs, but you will teach yourself to make better investment decisions before you act. Expenses add up. Thoughtful long-term investing can cut those fees and mean more money in your portfolio. Next week, financial markets at a multi-decade inflection point with Bank of America's influential equity strategist, Sabita Subramanian. In this week's extra feature, Christoph Gleich explains how majoring in physics at university helps his investment career. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.